Thanks very much, uh, Peter, and, um, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak today um, about work that me and many colleagues, uh, including those named there, have, um, have been involved in, in terms of trying to integrate traces into hydrological models to understand uh, better issues of celerity, velocity, and water age. And the place that we've mainly been working is this catchment you can see here, the Brunton Burn in the Cairngorms in Scotland. And um, I'd like to just talk about some of the model developments that we've gone through in terms of trying to understand some of these issues better in this catchment. So I'd like to give a quick consideration of the celerity velocity issue, because not everybody might know what it is. Um, how we can usefully use traces in hydrological models to better understand the flux, storage, and age dynamics of different component parts of the hydrological system. And then talk about some different types of isotope-aided hydrological models and some of the opportunities and challenges going forward. So celerities, velocities, and water ages. Um, Jeff McDonnell and Keith Bevan a few years ago um, wrote a commentary in WRR um, where they highlighted this as being an issue that hydrologists have largely been ignoring. And in hydrological models, uh, particularly for advancing hydrological models, one of the things that Jeff and Keith said in this commentary was probably the fundamental issue for understanding hydrological processes and our capability to model them is the explicit and routine of celerities and velocities in model development and testing. So what do we mean by these things? Um, well, celerity is something we're all familiar with. It's the speed of the hydrological response, the speed of the rainfall runoff transformation, which if we're dealing with something like floods can be in the matter of a few hour, minutes to a few hours that rivers can respond to rainfall inputs. But that's not the same as the velocity of water particles that generally um, generate flood responses or any hydrological response because usually that is orders of magnitude slower than what the celerity of the hydrological response is. And that's because rainfall or precipitation coming into a catchment mixes with water that's already stored in the catchment that has a characteristic residence time um, and water that becomes integrated into the flow system of a catchment um, becomes part of a residence time distribution, which is the average age of water in that storage. And then the travel time or the average age of water exiting a hydrological system, like in a stream or in soil water, whichever part of the system we choose to look at, has a characteristic travel time distribution. And so these things are all quite different, but interact interactive. And they're important that we understand those in terms of understanding what hydrological models are telling us and what they aren't telling us. And there's nothing new in this. Over 30 years ago, um, the first generation of water quality models that Colin Neal and colleagues at uh, the then Institute of Hydrology were trying to develop for the Plin Limon catchments uh, came up against this issue. And they were interested in understanding acidification, particularly acid high flow events in the Plin Limon catchments. And they were wanting to carry out hydrochemical modeling of these events. And so any hydrochemical model needs some kind of hydrological framework. So they had a simple kind of conceptual two bucket model to simulate acid stream runoff and uh, alkaline base flow. And we could do that relatively well. And the models could also simulate um, the stream flow response. In other words, the celerity of the rainfall input. But one of the things that they tested this model against was the um, inclusion of a passive tracer in the model. And in Plinlimon, on the near the west coast of Wales, chloride in rainfall shows a distinct seasonality. You can measure high concentrations of chloride, especially in the winter, when stormy conditions in the Atlantic inject a lot of sea salt into the atmosphere. So the tracer kind of tags the rainfall, if you like, and we see that that rainfall signal gets replicated in the stream, but it's massively damped and it's massively lagged, and that's because the, um, the rainfall coming into the catchment is mixing with water that's already stored there to, to a greater or lesser extent, depending upon which flow paths it follows to the stream. So when Colin and colleagues introduced chloride as a passive tracer into the model, they couldn't simulate the chloride. Chloride doesn't interact with anything in the catchment, um, but because the hydrological models are kind of conditioned to simulate 
the celerity of the stream flow response, they don't capture the storages that give you the water velocities. So in other words, the models capture celerity, but the models fail to represent the flow velocities of fluxes because they don't fully characterize storage or conceptualize mixing. And that's true of most hydrological models even now, despite attempts to kind of advance this field over the last um, de few decades. And it's important to think about what most of our hydrological models do in rela relation to storage. Storage is usually explicitly considered as some kind of um, nonlinear kind of function that's influencing our attempts to model the runoff response. But usually in most hydrological models, we're not dealing with the total catchment storage. Often we don't know that. Uh, what we're dealing with is the dynamic storage that kind of is regulated by the water balance. You know, it, fills up when, when it rains, it draws down, when there's no rain and we've got ET. But as the traces show, that's only a, a, only a small part of what we call the mobile storage or the storage that's interacting in the uh, flow system in terms of generating the runoff response. But it's water that's taking much longer to get through to the stream. And there's also immobile storage as well, which to all intents and purposes isn't participating in the hydrological cycle. So how do we try and better understand um, these uh, differences in storage and how do we try and better understand velocities of flow paths and what they tell us about water ages? Well, one of the ways that we can do this, but we rarely do, is by um, collecting tracer data routinely uh, along with hydrometric data. And in the Scottish catchment that I showed on my introductory slide, um, we, have, we have been collecting daily isotope samples in rainfall and stream flow for the last 10 years now. And isotopes basically give what we measure are heavier isotopes like deuterium or oxygen 18, which are the heavier isotopes in the water molecule. So like chloride, they're a natural passive tracer. And what we see in Scotland or anywhere is we see a lot of, a huge amount of day-to-day -day variability in the isotopic composition of the rain because it dep depends upon what the evaporation temperature is of that water before it comes rainfall. The hotter it is, the more enriched or the more energy there is, the more we can get rain that's enriched in heavier isotopes. And the colder it is, the more it's depleted in heavy isotopes. So in amongst this kind of day-to-day -day variability, we tend to find that during winter, we get our most depleted rainfall samples that are depleted in heavier isotopes. And they tend to be most enriched during the summer, but we don't see that very clearly on the day-to-day -day variability. But if we monitor the isotopes in stream flow responses on the same time scale, we see that the catchment acts like a low pass filter on the rainfall signal so we get kind of some of the season, we get the seasonality coming out very clearly, the winter kind of depletion of cold winter rainfall events. We see the summer enrichment pretty well. Um, and we also see the event by event variability of whether the rainfall exerts a stronger signal on the stream. But like the chloride in plinlimon, the variability is damped by an order of magnitude. So there's a huge amount of storage and a huge amount of mixing going on in the catchment, even though it's a very kind of flashy mountainous catchment in essence. And so if we have this kind of information, we can use it in various kinds of hydrological models to look at this kind of input output response of the tracer along with the rainfall runoff response to infer what the relative dominance of kind of near surface rapid hydrological pathways or the slow flowing subsurface pathways and the degrees of mixing that are going on. And then we can calculate or estimate the average age of the stream water on a particular day or in a particular sample. And we can see this varies in this particular catchment from the, the order of magnitude of a few months in the biggest rainfall events to a few years during the drier conditions. And we can get uncertainty estimates around that. So this illustrates quite well this difference between celerity and velocity, where the celerities are responding on the time scale of hours. But in rainfall events, even the biggest rainfall events, the average age of the stream flow is a few months old. So the celerity is a, a if you like, a, a, a kind of wave, wave propagation through the catchment, largely displacing old water that's been sat around for many months, even in the biggest events in this catchment. And so understanding these relationships with different types of catchments can be very insightful. But 
Incorporating this kind of information in hydrological models can start to help us understand what these storage dynamics are. If we look at a kind of typical, one of the starting points we had for this catchment was just a simple lumped conceptual model, like the one we saw at Plinlimon. It's basically kind of mixing a kind of um, storm runoff response from a, a kind of quick flow storage, uh, which has got a, a flux of water with a concentration of a tracer, together with a, a, a groundwater reservoir, which has got a flux of water and a concentration. Now, as we saw in the Plinlimon situation, we can simulate flows quite well, just calibrating a model like this to some uh, relatively few hydrological parameters. But if we want to, if we want to estimate the, um, uh, the a model of traces reasonably well, we need to have mixing volumes in each of these stores. And that gives us a hint as to what the rest of the passive storage is beyond the dynamic storage that controls the celerity of the hydrological response, it gives us a fuller picture of the storage that's kind of involved that's, um, in mixing the tracer in the flow system. So if we have tracer data like the ones that I showed for Scotland or the example for Plinlimon, we can use those tracers in calibration. So we're not just trying to simulate the discharge of celerity, we're trying to accurately represent the uh, velocity uh, field within the hydrological model. And this is obviously, it's done quite a lot in groundwater type models where the flows are much less responsive and, and flows are on a much longer time scale, but it's quite rare in most catchment hydrological models to be able to characterize this. But for the remainder of the talk, I just want to talk about a more kind of sophisticated approach we've taken to integrating traces into models and a modeling, uh, a new model that we've developed in the last few years called ECHO ISO. It's developed uh, on the, the back of a model called ECHO, which was developed by Marco Manita at the University of Montana. And it basically integrates a, a physically based water balance model that can be distributed, uh, which characterizes um, the eco-hydrology of canopy interactions, the subsurface uh, flow regime. That's linked with an energy balance model to drive the evapotranspiration. And the eco-hydrology is explicitly parameterized within the model and the dynamics of vegetation are parameterized as well, because as we increasingly find, there are limitations in just using a kind of large leaf type penman monteith type approach to estimating ET. So with this model, um, we've been able to, um, on the back of the hydrological module, basically track traces through the different storages within the catchment. And we can parameterize the model to mix um, the traces to a full or a partial extent um, to try and understand better the flux storage age interactions within the, within the model domain. And in, in addition to, do that, to doing that, we also need to account for the fractionation of, that, of uh, isotopes due to uh, evaporation from the soil surface or open water surfaces. And we can, there are models that we can, uh, or algorithms that we can use to, to get a first approximation of that. So we can have a physically based isotope model that sits uh, alongside a hydrological model. And we've applied this or developed the model and applied it to the Brundtland Burn catchment that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, it's a three square kilometer catchment in the Cairngorms. It goes from about 600 meters to about 200 meters. Uh, it's a glaciated valley like many in the UK uplands. It's got peat bogs in the valley bottom and more freely draining kind of podsole soils on the steeper valley sides. And the catchment has a lot of storage in it. There's wet, the, the peatlands hold a lot of water, hence why we get a lot of mixing of the precipitation signal. They're sustained by groundwater during dry periods, and then there's kind of nonlinear expansion of the saturated area in events that we need to models to be able to characterize. And in this catchment, we've been doing distributed hydrometric measurements. We've essentially uh, been measuring stream flow and precipitate at the catchment outlet. Um, we've been measuring soil moisture, a number of soil moisture stations throughout the catchment. We've got some plots where we're looking at evapotranspiration and sap flux. And uh, we've also got three weather stations where we can look at radiation uh, budgets and so on. So we've got, it's quite a data rich catchment and we've been operating it for quite a long time. So then in terms of conceptualizing the catchment for the model, we've been operating on a kind of 100 meter by 100 meter grid square uh, for the three square kilometer catchment. So it's not incredibly finely resolu re resolution, but it's, it's not too bad. And we've essentially parameterized the catchment according to soil type, which basically maps onto the vegetation. We have 
heather on the steep hill slopes. We have sphagnum peat in the valley bottoms and a bit of Scots pine in some areas. And with the data that we've got, we've been able to um, calibrate the model just with hydrometric data. So using stream flow data, soil moisture data, transpiration data, net radiation, and we've had sufficient for model calibration and model evaluation in terms of running the model. And so even without using any tracer data, in this case, we're using the tracers as a, as a, a validation tool with the model, we get pretty good simulations of stream discharge. We get good simulations of soil moisture in the wet valley bottom peaks and on the freely draining slope side areas. We get good simulations of the, of the transpiration that we're measuring at sap flux sensors. And we get a good overall representation of the hydrology in the catchment. We thought we'd need to use the traces as additional constraints on the calibration. But when we just looked at how the traces moved through these different stores, we had tracer data uh, from um, soil water stations, from groundwater in the plants island and in the uh, in rainfall and runoff from coming out the catchment. And the model shown in the, the orange there for the tracer simulates the tracer as well as it simulates stream discharge. We get better discharge simulations if we just calibrate on discharge, but if we include, the, uh, if we, uh, given that we're tracking the traces as well, and we are, know we're simulating soil water and those other um, variables um, well, we, we have much more confidence that the model's giving a, a reasonable representation of the hydrological function of this catchment in, in time and space, because the traces are showing that. And more importantly, they're not just showing it in the stream, the traces that we measure in the valley bottom wetlands in terms of the isotope variability is pretty well captured. It's well captured on the catchment hill slopes. We have very damped groundwater tracer signals that the model captures pretty well. And for the root water uptake from the heather at least, we get reasonable simulations of what we've measured within the plant xylem. So having this kind of characterization of the fluxes, storage, and tracer interactions, we can then get estimates of the water ages that are underpinning that variability of the stream water age from a few months at high flows to a few years at, at low flows. And so we can see the soil water over time has a, a varying age, getting younger when it's wetter, older when it's drier, and it gets older as you get deeper in the soils, it becomes older still in the groundwater, but it depends where you are in the catchment. If you're in the valley bottom area, the groundwater is quite old. If you're in the, for, a, for an upland headwater catchment, if you're on the hill slopes, the groundwater is much younger. And similarly, the stream tends to get older as you go down the stream channel and you get groundwater in the valley bottom mixing. So just to sort of, that's fine in terms of where you've got a, a nice, um, a well instrumented catchment. I just wanted to finish off by saying we're currently looking at using these models for kind of upscaling to bigger scales. We're looking at a catchment in Germany where there's 70 square kilometers. We've got a nice mix between kind of forested and agricultural land. And this, a bit like Jeff talked about in East Anglia, is an area where climate change scenarios are, are really scary going forward. And there's a lot more water used by forests than by agriculture in this area. And essentially, there's only about 10, 20% of rainfall coming in that's available for groundwater recharge and stream flow. And obviously, models at this big scale need to be um, usually um, parameterized on a coarser model grid. And we've been using the tracers, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but we've been using the tracers to look at grid sizes of 250 to a squ uh, square kilometer, sorry, 250 by 250 meters to a square kilometer, and seeing whether the model can simulate isotopes in these larger catchments. And generally it can, but only when you've got a, a relatively fine grid scale, because of the averaging, uh, you'd lose the kind of nonlinear runoff processes that cause the kind of tracer variability. Now that might be important, might not be important for certain purposes, but for some, it will be important. So it illustrates the potential of these kind of models at larger scales. And with that, um, I just wanted to kind of sum up by hopefully, I've shown that tracer and model, tracers and models can help us understand both celerity and velocity. They can better represent flux storage interactions, gives us an insight into the value of water age estimates and can be critical to many uh, applied problems. Of course, I'm not advocating these are the solutions to everybody should be using traceated models. But if we think of models as multiple working hypotheses of catchments, then um, they're a valuable tool in our toolbox for understanding hydrological function better. Thank you.